Dave, do you want to kick us off shortly? Hi, great. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so thank you, uh, Leslie, and welcome, everybody, and thank you for participating in this important and interesting workshop. I am Dave Clark. I'm a program officer at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Um, other day, uh, my comments are going to be brief if you want to start bringing up the first slide set. Um, I would like to start by ex expressing my, my appreciation and gratitude for this next panel for participation in this meeting, but really more so for the outstanding work that they've accomplished in, in their respective fields. I've had the pleasure of working directly with some of the panelists, but have been following all of their work for, for some years. Uh, what we're going to attempt to tackle today is to open the discussion on opioid tapering as it relates to physical dependence and how this fits into a multimodal or interdisciplinary uh, healthcare setting. Uh, I, Stefan Curtez mentioned some of the, the important issues with tapering during his talk, and I really appreciated the presentations from both Jessica Hulsey and Kristen Beasley, which showed some of the challenges with tapering opioids for persons with opioid use disorders and or chronic pain conditions. Uh, I especially appreciate those comments as these areas happen to be a major focus of my research portfolio here at the NCCIH. So we're going to start this session with presentations from Dr. Da from Beth Darnall and then Dr. Amy Wackholt to start to start setting the table or continue setting the table. Uh, following these two, pre two presentations, we're going to ask for comments from our other esteemed panelists before opening to the larger group discussion. So without further ado, Beth, if you're ready, I will turn things over to you. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. And these are just my disclosures. Next slide, please. So 100 million American adults are living with ongoing pain of some type. And increased opioid prescribing that we saw beginning in the early 2000s was in part a reflection of our poor investment as a nation to treat pain comprehensively and offering lowest risk treatments first. Next slide. As you've heard this morning, the biopsychosocial model of pain is vitally important to both appreciate and in terms of treating individuals with pain. So we need to address the needs of the whole person Pain, of course, being a dynamic experience that's influenced by cognition, emotion, context, a whole host of factors. Next slide. And we see that even our expectations for treatments have the ability to modulate whether those treatments work, whether they provide relief, or whether they amplify pain. This is what we fundamentally know is both the placebo and nocebo effect. Next slide. And while there's been better appreciation for the multidimensional experience of pain, it's been less appreciation for the multidimensional experience for opioid response. And this was a fascinating study conducted by Irene Tracy and colleagues. Next slide, please. And in this experiment, this was conducted in healthy individuals who were brought into the lab where they experienced an evoked pain paradigm coupled with IV remifentanil administration. And this was the constant. Everyone received pain and opioid analgesia across three different experimental conditions in which patients' expectations and beliefs were manipulated. And in condition one, when people were receiving remifentanil and they were told they were receiving remifentanil, their analgesic benefit from the medication was doubled relative to when people were told that they were simply receiving saline in the IV drip. And when people were told that they were receiving a substance that would worsen their pain, it completely abolished the opioid, uh, the analgesic benefit of the remifentanil. So this standing as an illustration of how we need to consider the multidimensional experience of opioid response. Next slide. And this slide illustrating the psychological modulation of opioid analgesia. Next slide. 
By 2015 in America, up to 11 million individuals were taking daily prescription opioids. This is almost three and a half percent of US adults. And so very quickly, there became a problem where tapering implementation got ahead of the science and tapering wasn't necessarily being performed the right way or having careful attention to both the multi-dimensional experience of pain, but also this multi-dimensional uh, response to opioid analgesia and opioid reduction. And what we see was that when opioids were being reduced, that patient nocebo could be amplified precisely at the time when opioids were being reduced, thereby undermining opioid analgesia for the remaining opioids that they were taking. We also see another problem associated with tapering was that the physiologic and neurobiological adaptations um, that occur with long-term opioid use were not well appreciated or attended to. And then lastly, some patients may be benefiting from opioids and require them for analgesia. But how do we discern who's benefiting and who is not? And the data were simply lacking. Next slide, please. We know that fewer new starts is the best way to decrease opioid prescriptions. And patients who've been taking long-term opioids require very careful considerations, as we heard from some of the morning presentations. Reducing opioid doses actually creates new health risks. And the right methodology must be applied to minimize iatrogenic risks associated with deprescribing. And this is really at the core of applying patient-centered principles. Next slide. In 2016, we saw the CDC guidelines were put forward. And really, the intention of the CDC guideline was focused on conservative new starts and dose increases. But somehow these guidelines became generalized and applied to opioid tapering. Misapplication to blanket tapering based on rigid dose-based limits was seen at the state level and even at the national level. And this was never the intention of the CDC. This was really what we saw as being a one-size-fits-all approach to opioid reduction. Next slide. And we saw that this was not serving our patients well, as evidenced by a whole host of different studies outlining some of these iatrogenic harms. And some of this was covered in the morning session, so I won't belabor it. But what was really put forward was that we need careful patient monitoring, that it should be applied both before a taper and intensified during and after a taper to ensure that our patients are doing better to ensure that we're actually helping people and not harming them. Next slide. There was a growing outcry against the iatrogenic harms that we were observing for prescription opioid reduction and a better appreciation that we can't be harming patients in the name of helping them. So how do we fix this? We absolutely need better data, both for tapering and also characterizing these iatrogenic harms. Next slide. A fantastic step in the right direction was the HHS guide for clinicians on opioid reduction. And they put forward that opioid tapering should be done individually and, and really dismantling a one size fits all approach. And I'd like to submit that one step further would be a requirement for us to assess the multi-dimensional experience of patients prior to taper, during taper, and after taper. We really need patient-reported outcomes as critical metrics. This remains a persistent omission in clinical care and research that must be addressed. Next slide. So in order to apply this model of biopsychosocial treatment for pain and for a biopsychosocial model of tapering, we first have to measure the right variables, monitor patients carefully, and then adjust the care plan based on their response. It's really bringing patients into the center of the entire focus of their health care. Next slide. 
And when we talk to patients about, you know, what are they most concerned about with opioid tapering? Well, unsurprisingly, they're concerned about their pain increasing. Next slide. And we see that when opioid tapering is performed the right way, that pain actually does not increase. But these data that are consistently shown are typically collected in intensive inpatient and outpatient settings where patients receive a whole host of treatments. It's comprehensive care and their needs are being addressed and they're being supported comprehensively. And these are the types of services that virtually none of our patients in the community can access. Next slide. So what's been lacking are community-based solutions that are low cost, low risk, scalable, and then ultimately enhance patient willingness to partner in gentle opioid tapering so that we're not unwittingly enhancing nocebo. Next slide. And this is a focus of research within my group. Um, we conducted the first study on patient-centered prescription opioid tapering. This was in community outpatients with chronic pain in which we invited all patients in both um, urban and rural clinics in Colorado overseen by a single pain physician. We invited them to participate in a four-month prescription opioid reduction program. This was voluntary and we only excluded for active treatment for substance use disorder. So patients who enrolled in this study, a fraction of them certainly had opioid use disorder, though we didn't char characterize that carefully. Of the 110 patients who were invited to join, 68 did choose to partner with us in this study. And of those 68, 51 completed the four-month program. That means that 17 patients dropped out, and there was only one characteristic that distinguished patients who completed versus those who dropped out, and that was depression. So I would also like to highlight that patients with greater depressive um, symptom severity self-selected out of this study, and that's important for us to consider when we're factoring in the risks and harms. Um, next slide, please. Our study focused on minimizing nocebo among patients. Next slide. And we did this not by talking about opioid cessation at all. We, we focused on opioid reduction. Our narrative was we want to partner with you and help you achieve your lowest comfortable dose over the course of four months. Next slide. We also minimized nocebo. Um, next slide, please. We also minimize nocebo by optimizing patient choice and control in their taper. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're going backwards. Okay. One more. Yep, here we are, thanks. Um, so participation was voluntary and we focused on optimizing patient choice and control. So they could control the, tape, the pace of their taper, they could pause the taper, they were free to drop out of the study. They could just stop it if they wanted to. The taper was not to a predefined opioid dose. And most importantly is this last bullet point, the taper was not unidirectional. So that if patients needed to go up, if they were having insufficient analgesia, we did allow for that. Next slide. And so these were the study variables um, that we collected. We were focusing on uh, daily um, opioid dose. Next slide. And I just present these sample characteristics so you can see it was a pretty typical pain clinic um, sample where uh, on opioids for many years, middle-aged and quite high um, morphine equivalent daily dose, almost 300, and you can see the range there. Next slide. And what we found was that by applying um, these methods over the course of four months, patients on average substantially reduced their daily morphine equivalent daily dose by about half. Next slide. And we found that initial opioid dose did not predict taper response, meaning that even patients who are on higher doses of opioids and very high doses did equally well. Next slide. 
And most importantly, on average, we found that by applying these methods in a patient-centered manner, that as patients were reducing their opioid doses, their pain was not increasing. Next slide. But this is the really important sli slide that I want to present. I was speaking earlier about our average, kind of our mean and median response to the taper. But of course, we don't treat averages and we don't treat opioid doses. We treat people and there's individual differences that must be appreciated. So I've highlighted here the people who had increased pain. And I've also highlighted here the people who had increased opioid doses. And these are the people that we need to pay careful attention to and ensure that our policies are protecting them and attention and paying attention to them. Next slide. And so we're now translating um, our pilot results into psychologically informed patient-centered opioid reduction in a large clinical trial that's sponsored by um, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. And this is a study of voluntary opioid reduction. Again, next slide. This is a large clinical trial of almost 1,400 patients taking daily prescription opioids long-term. These are our study sites, and we have 11 clinics in total. These are primary care and pain clinics. Um, next slide. This is a pragmatic trial, meaning that we have very minimal um, exclusionary criteria, and it's embedded within the context of medical care, pain care. Um, these are the eligibility criteria. You see that we only exclude for active suicidality. Um, importantly, we are excluding for moderate to severe opioid use disorders. So we do screening as described here. People with mild opioid use disorder remain in our study. Next slide. We focus on enhancing the physician-patient bond and enhancing patient choice and control. Next slide. Because Empower is voluntary, the imperative is on us to ensure that we create a caring and safe system that makes patients want to join and remain in Empower. Next slide. So we're really focusing on the biopsychosocial model of tapering. Next slide. Everyone who comes into Empower is agreeing to a voluntary opioid reduction program that will occur over the course of 12 months. So we're really extending out from the pilot study, which was only four months. And again, the goal is to partner with their doctor to achieve their lowest comfortable dose. Um, it's not to a predefined dose. Everyone who comes in is randomized to one of three treatment groups, um, eight week pain CBT, six-week chronic pain self-management, or usual care, which is simply the taper only. And we're doing a comparative effectiveness study where we hope to be able to show that our behavioral treatments ideally enhance patient response to the taper and improve their pain control. Our outcome measure is uh, it's a dual primary outcome focusing on pain control and opioid reduction. We recognize that reducing opioids isn't the point in isolation. We have to address both and studying both. Next slide. We use a careful um, patient reported outcome platform um, that carefully assesses patient response every step of the way. Um, so this is Choir, and this is the platform that's used throughout all of our study sites. These are just some of the, um, the factors that that we're measuring, and I want to highlight that we're assessing degree of choice and readiness to taper at baseline. These are um, understudied and underappreciated. Next slide. We closely monitor for patient response to opioid reduction. We do this at the weekly level for withdrawal symptoms, patient discomfort, mood. Um, we have free text um, fields for patients to input information. We survey at the monthly level for suicidality, for mood changes, for their satisfaction with program. Um, our system 
allows for alerts to be sent to their healthcare providers and their prescribers in real time. So that if a patient is in distress, that distress message can go out to as many as three or four individuals. We have real time responses, tailored messages. Patients receive based on the symptom they're, that they're reporting and the severity of that symptom. So for instance, imagine that a patient is reporting acute suicidality or any, any suicidality. Uh, those alerts are sent in real time as well as messages coming up to directly address um, the distress that a patient is experiencing. We provide validation, we provide compassionate messaging, and we most importantly, we provide action items for the that all call national hotline local resources and we tell them what actions the clinic will take to address their symptoms as well and what their options are and this is active over the course of 12 months patients tell us that they're getting better care and empowered than they would otherwise because there's a closer feedback loop between their experience and the care they're receiving um, next slide and I just want to give you two quick data displays for how we can track people. So this being a person who is reducing their opioid dose over time, and you see that their pain is remaining relatively static over the course of six months. Next slide. But recognizing that opioid doses and pain aren't necessarily even the most important metrics. We wanna know how people are doing, how are the people doing? And so we can provide these comprehensive, multi-dimensional assessments so that we're assured that people are not decompensating or deteriorating. Um, we remain in close contact with them and observe them throughout the study. And last slide, please. So for patient-centered opioid stewardship, we're focusing on voluntary reduction, enhancing choice and control. Really, this has been shown across multiple studies that there's an imperative to increase follow-up and communication, both during and after a taper. We need to be tracking closely with patient-reported outcomes. And importantly, not just tracking, but also adjusting the care plan to reflect the need we need to recognize that not everyone can and should reduce their opioid doses. We need to stop the taper when patients are in acute distress and deteriorating. Um, programs that expouse never go backwards on a taper, not patient-centered. And the last thing I want to say is that a poor response to an opioid taper is not itself a reflection of a mental illness. It can reflect a primary need for analgesia, and that needs to be carefully appreciated as well. Last slide. And with that, I would just say thank you and answer any questions. Thank you, Beth. Um, I see there's a, a clarifying question in the chat box from Kevin Bradley, actually two questions. Uh, first is, did you exclude moderate to severe opioid use disorder and what percent were excluded? And follow up, what were the barriers to including patients with OUD? Yeah, oh, I wish we had those data. This is a, the really unfortunate thing about our pilot study was that we only excluded for people who were receive, actively receiving treatment for opioid use disorder or substance use disorder. And so we didn't characterize the fraction undoubtedly who had um, opioid use disorder somewhere on the spectrum. So. Um, we're now doing that very carefully in the EMPOWER study, but I'm, unfortunately, I don't have anything to share on that. And uh, one more clarifying question um, before we move on to the next presentation is, um, can you comment on the feasibility of recruitment for EMPOWER? Yeah, um, great question. Um, you know, one of our challenges with Empower is that opioid prescribing is down substantially. And so um, that's one of the challenges. You know, I said in 2015, there were 11 million Americans taking daily prescription opioids. Um, I don't know the recent numbers. I haven't seen anything more recent um, than the 2017 publication, but there are markedly fewer people taking opioids. Um, right now, we've been active for about 18 months enrolling, and we have about 265 patients enrolled. 
Um, and so we have another 600 to go um, to reach our full number for the clinical trial. Great, thank you so much, Beth. Um, I, I know I could talk about just this topic for the next hour and a half, but we do have another presentation and then uh, some comments and open discussion. So uh, let's switch gears now to Amy Wackholtz. Amy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Awesome, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. So today I'm, I'm going to focus my talk a little bit different. And I'm going to really be looking at both the challenges as well as the opportunities for multimodal pain treatment, looking at both for patients that are struggling with that overlap between chronic pain and opioid use disorder, and how do we begin to both identify the challenges that are inherent in that treatment as well as developing better treatment uh, protocols for that. And I want to begin by stating I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, uh, and I wanted to give a, a deep and heartfelt thank you to both NIDA and NCCIH uh, for sponsoring my, my research. Uh, next slide, please. So the good news, uh, as other speakers have said already this morning, is there have been recent declines in opioid prescribing. Uh, about half of the counties in the United States have reported a decrease in the, the MMEs prescribed per person. Um, However, the rate of prescribing is still very high, uh, three times higher in 2015 than in 1999, um, and that's a, a range of 640 to 180 MMEs. Uh, in 2018, in the United States, there were 51.4 opioid prescriptions for every 100 persons. So we're still really looking at, there's a significant number of opioids that are out there, uh, and this is still an issue. Uh, in 2015 alone, enough opioids were prescribed for every American to be medicated around the clock for three weeks. So, um, you know, e and even at low doses, when people are prescribed long-term opioids of three months or longer, it increases the risk of addiction by 15 times. So even though we're, we're on a good trend, and that's, that's a great thing, um, it's still not solved in any way, shape, or form. We are still looking at very high levels of, of opioid prescriptions that are out there. We're looking at long-term opioid prescriptions, and we're still looking at elevated levels of opioid prescriptions. Next slide, please. And as Jessica Holsey detailed a little bit earlier, COVID is certainly creating additional problems related to more stressors, uh, more financial concerns, infection fears, um, and changed access to care that definitely need to be taken into account when we're looking both short-term and long-term, because as, as those of us who've worked in this field know well, a short-term issue may become a long-term relapse. And so that we may be, even if, if we can say, oh, COVID is a two-year issue, hopefully cross our fingers, um, long-term, this may have long-term consequences for someone's health and well-being and ability to maintain sobriety. Um, and obviously we're still in the very early stages and data collection is far from complete at this point, but there certainly are some indicators that COVID is going to create an extra layer of challenge with dealing with this complex problem. And next slide, please. Because among other things, we know that when stress goes up, pain goes up. And as other speakers have given great reviews today about that link in the brain, uh, we do know that when there's elevated stress levels, people tend to experience greater pain. And we know that pain is related to opioid relapse. And so everything from uh, when someone has moderate pain, they're 2.6 times more likely to relapse uh, compared to individuals that have OUD alone, but no pain. And whenever they're experiencing severe pain, OUD and pain patients are over five times more likely to relapse than patients with OUD alone. So certainly this pain issue becomes something that needs to be addressed and needs to be treated in the context of OUD. And that if all we look at is the OUD component or if all we look at is the pain component as though they're siloed issues, we're going to miss that interplay that occurs. And that's so critical into helping people maintain long-term um, Health, healthy lifestyle. Next slide, please. 
And as we know, pain and opioid use disorder really does create a multi-prong issue. We can't uh, look at only one piece here or one piece here and that there's everything from activity levels or functional activity levels that are important to monitor. Things such as sleep quality and the impact that opioids have on sleep quality, not just quantity, but quality. Uh, the level of social support someone gets both for their pain conditions as well as for their OUD condition the addiction potential of any medications that patients are put on, that schedule of medications, as we, as we well know now that um, short-acting meds are more likely to cause addiction triggers for, for some patients, uh, or, or more long-acting meds may have, if they don't have the uh, polymer coating that prevents injection or snorting, um, may cause relapse and problems due to taking it not as it's recommended. Um, looking at things like weight gain. Uh, so if someone is experiencing a, a number of other issues and then they experience weight gain on top of it, either due to the pain decreasing their activity levels or due to medications that may be obesogenic, uh, they may be getting additional pain considerations in their knees, ankles, hips uh, from an arthritic type conditions. Mood, as Beth pointed out from her study, depression, anxiety, all of these components need to come into play and to be monitored when we're working with patients with OUD and pain because they're critically important not just to the pain experience that a patient is going to, going to have, but also to the likelihood of relapse. The next thing is one that oftentimes I find a lot of clinicians don't, whoops, sorry, no, go back, not quite yet, yet. Um, that clinicians and researchers often don't, don't consider uh, in this context of pain and OUD is, are the patient's basic needs being met? Um, are the patient's lights being kept on? Are they able to pay their gas bill, their electricity bill? Um, because a lot of times I'm finding that, that both researchers and clinicians don't necessarily know what the street value is of the medications that they're giving. And don't know that, you know, for Oxycontin, it's a dollar a milligram. So an 80 milligram pill is $80 on the street. And so if somebody is struggling with keeping the lights on or feeding their family, you know, selling a pill or two may be the difference between getting evicted from, from their apartment and being able to keep a roof over their heads. So helping understand how those basic needs are getting met so that patients don't need to get into a diversion situation that may then create a downstream effect with other people um, struggling with addiction and opioid use disorder, et cetera. The next piece is that what CAM or what integrative medicine is being used. Uh, because a lot of times patients are using CAM and integrated medicine, alternative and integrative medicine, but they may not necessarily be sharing these things with their providers. And some of these are very, very helpful. Some of these might be supplements that are actually causing liver damage or might be interfering with the liver pathways of the medications that are, they're taking. And so making sure that we're monitoring um, and, and helping providers ask the questions about alternative and integrated care use is something else that really needs to be addressed because if we're not monitoring those issues, um, then again, we, we might be causing problems with down, downstream. And part of this as well may, may be, um, and I don't have it in there and I missed a bubble, uh, would be things such as smoking, where we know that that's tobacco use, um, particularly smoking, can change how fast opioids are um, are processed in the liver and so may actually change the metabolism of those opioids and how a person experiences high levels versus low levels and suddenly a, what's supposed to be a 12 hour pill conks out in eight hours uh, and this patient then gets labeled as drug seeking or another stigma stigmatized term um, because we don't understand or haven't shared with the patient the impact that their smoking might have on, on um, their medications as well. So again, another set of challenges with multi-pronged issues. Okay, now next slide, please. Also, as part of this is part of um, some research that I've been doing, looking at the psychophysiology and, and uh, the pain experience for patients that are on long-term opioid use. This was a study where we brought in 120 patients, all that had chronic pain. They were recruited from four different groups. And they were individuals that were in for already taking four different types of, of opioid approaches. One was on methadone, one 
one group was on bupin, one group was on prolonged absence, which means they had a history of prolonged opioid use, but they had absolutely no opioid use of any type um, to be in our study. They had to be at least six months with no opioid use whatsoever, um, but the average was about, um, the mean was about two and a half years with a standard deviation of six months, so most of our patients were two to three years with no opioid use of any kind. Uh, and then the, the last group was chronic pain, but opioid naive. And we define that as having less than two weeks of lifetime experience of any kind with opioids. And what we're finding, and this directly relate, relates to the, the impact of taper, is that even patients that have prolonged abstinence showed greater pain sensitivity and less pain tolerance than patients that were opioid naive. So long-term exposure to opioids, even if that's historical exposure to opioids, seems to create this permanent or at least semi-permanent change, because again, most of our patient population was two to three years out for that prolonged absence group, that can have a long-term effect on both their sensitivity to pain as well as their tolerance to pain. And we used a, a trigger of a cold presser task, uh, particularly for, for our acute pain situation. But what this means is that once patients have been on pain, have been on opioids for a prolonged period of time, there may be that permanent or semi-permanent change that needs to be taken account and needs to be addressed in any tapering protocol. Next slide, please. Challenge number six, there seems to be long-term changes of how people physiologically respond to pain. Um, and this would be, sorry, can you, uh, there, were, there were some active pieces, there we go. Um, so active opioid users in, this, in the methadone and the buprenorphine group had delayed heart rate reactivity to a cold presser pain task compared to the opioid-free groups. So this was, they went through the system, they got the pain condition. When they chose to end the pain condition with pain sensitivity and pain tolerance, they ended it. And even five minutes later, in the recovery one period, they were still showing escalated levels of, of heart rate. In fact, their heart rate continued to rise even after the pain was taken away. So they have this delayed response, this delayed physiological response, even after a pain flare might be over or after a pain situation may be done. And what this means is that for patients that are on long-term steady state opioid agonists, there may they may have altered physiological responses to pain. This can create a Pavlov's dog sort of situation where patients may actually begin to learn that this is how their body responds to pain over a long period of time if they're making this observation. And they be, may become familiar with this pattern. And so there needs to be a very intentional psychophysiological retraining for patients that have been on opioids for prolonged periods of time so that we can address this with patients, both educating them that this may be the pattern that they have and that this does not need to be the pattern that they have, um, that they can actually change that physiological pattern over a period of time. Okay. Uh, next, next slide, please. And challenge number seven is that there are limited treatment options for patients with pain and OUD. So for example, um, this is actually a self-portrait of a patient from our clinic uh, who donated it, donated it to our clinic after he went through a, a series of our, uh, some of some of our psychophysiological uh, pain treatment studies. And he, he brought this in and, and gifted it to the clinic. And, and this was his self-portrait of like, this is how I lived uh, for, for many, many years because he was struggling with finding either a pain clinic that would help treat him in the context of OUD or an addiction center that can't really treat him due to legal reasons for his pain. They could treat the OUD, but not the pain. Primary care that really they were well-meaning, but they weren't really trained in how to do this. And so he was really struggling with finding someplace that could treat uh, both the chronic pain condition as well as the opioid use disorder. Um, and, and unfortunately, his story is not alone, and we know this from research as well, but uh, I always highlight this self-portrait uh, that this artistic patient uh, ha gave us because I think it's so, so important to recognize. Okay. Next slide, please. 
So now we know some of the challenges. I certainly can't say that I've highlighted all the challenges, but certainly some of the challenges. So how do we begin to develop the solutions? We start by creating, understanding the full psychosocial components of what's going on here. So a good multimodal pain and OUD treatment is certainly going to in include psychological components, pharmacological or medical components, physical components, and I do differentiate that from, from medical components. So physical components might be things like exercise, physical therapy, et cetera, basic needs, as previously mentioned, spiritual components for patients that uh, feel that that is part, an important part of their life, and social components. So even though historically we have been very, very siloed, uh, how in our training in each of these areas, as well as how we approach each of those areas, multimodal pain treatment would really encompass each of these areas. Next slide, please. So one of the solutions that um, my lab in particular has been addressing is a treatment development called STOP, uh, where we're looking at it's called self-regulation therapy for opioid use and pain. And that took me quite a while to figure out that acronym. I was writing all kinds of notes on an airplane napkin and back when we used to be able to fly. And I'm sure uh, whoever was sitting next to me in the airplane seat was kind of really wondering why I was like doodling about opioids and pain and things like that. They probably, they kind of were giving me a little weird side eye for that. But I finally come up, came up with STOP. Self-regulation therapy for opioid use and pain. These are, this was based on the lessons learned from the psychophysiology needs assessment, uh, some of the research that I presented earlier. It really combines, at the same time, pain and OUD psychotherapy into a single treatment and integrates home biofeedback practice. We have these um, small bio dots that are almost like uh, mood rings, for those of you who remember mood rings, and they allow patients to continue the biofeedback practice at home and get immediate physiological response and immediate physiological understanding of like, oh wait, yeah, maybe I'm more stressed, maybe I'm less stressed. For patients that have traditionally been very disconnected from their body and maybe intentionally disconnected from their body because of both the pain and the OUD experience. It integrates exercise and functional ability, it integrates MAT, uh, it integrates social support, it integrates uh, spiritual resources if the patient desires, and, and perhaps one of the most important components, it includes training for addiction or pain for therapists in both of those areas because we, we worked closely in the development of, of STOP with community addiction treatment clinics. And we said, okay, well, what do you need? What, what, how do you treat addiction and, and how do you treat addiction and pain? And they said, well, one of the biggest barriers for us is that our addiction therapists, they're very good at OUD. They have no training whatsoever in pain management. And so part of this is also training addiction therapists how pain works in the body, how pain integrates with opioid use disorder, and so that there's this training component for therapists to be able to move forward and feel comfortable with this as well. And we, while we have STOP, and, and certainly, uh, like I said, a big thank you to, to my research funders for helping us with that. We're also in the process of either actively um, studying or in the process of developing things like I stop for inpatient stop, Y stop for youth, uh, T stop for tele, and then stopper for primary care. So we have all of these additional variations that are going on um, at this moment. Next slide, please. And we've had some very exciting findings so far uh, with, with stop. So things such as, with this, an ex the stage 1A treatment development study, we had no illicit drug use after week eight of a 12-week prog program. Uh, pre to post, you can see the pain tolerance went way up. Uh, and even after a three-month follow-up period, it did not decline. And at the same time, functional activity, uh, so engagement in that functional activity rose com considerably, significantly, uh, from pretest to the immediate post-intervention and didn't decline significantly even after a three-month follow-up period. Next slide, please. And of course, after stage 1A, you have to do a stage 1B. Uh, so we certainly, we certainly did that. Uh, looking at stop versus treatment as usual, we saw a significant decline. Um, this is pre to follow-up in current pain levels, pain interference with daily tasks, and days using illicit drugs in the past week uh, between the STOP protocol and treatment as usual. And on the, the scale on the left-hand side is a zero to five scale. 
the graph on the right hand side is a zero to 100 scale and we do have stop in there if you look very very closely we went from having 23.3 of a mean for opioid cravings stop is on there it's just there at a zero that none of our patients at follow-up were reporting any opioid cravings uh, and we are very very excited about that next slide please so what did we learn from, from all of this? Well, one, and, and probably the most obvious, is that pain, patients with pain and OUD are a unique, complex population, and we really need to understand the psychophysiology of what's happening with patients in order to fully understand the problem, because that can lead us to better treatments. That can lead us to helping patients, not just psychologically, but physiologically, physically, medically. Um, all of these components to really multimodal to create a multimodal approach to pain and OUD. And chronic pain patients with long-term opioid absence can actually act as exemplars to help us guide treatment development. They can help tell us, how did you do this? What tools, what skills did you learn? And largely had to learn on their own because we didn't, there wasn't treatment out there for, for patients that are struggling with this. What did they learn and how can we take those lessons and really integrate those and teach other patients that are currently and actively struggling with this to create better multimodal treatments? And those multimodal treatments to address both pain and OUD simultaneously really are key uh, to helping us develop better patient treatment protocols for this complex population. Next slide. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time. I saw there's a number of chats going through there, but I have to admit I didn't read them all uh, for obvious reasons. But if there's any questions, whoever, Dave, I think you're the, uh, the moderator for this, so I will pass it back to you. Uh, th thank you so much, Amy. That was a, a fantastic presentation. And you're right, there are a number of fantastic questions, uh, some for you and also some additional questions for, for Beth. So in interest of time, because I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, let me just go with the first two of the questions uh, for you that came up and we'll save the other questions for both you and Beth to the discussion that we'll get to the open discussion. So first question is from uh, Barbara St. Marie. She asked, uh, you used the term pain flare. And do you have a definition of what that is? So we use that as a we define that as acute, acute on chronic uh, pain. So any escalation of pain, um, particularly in our, in our particular study, we triggered that. So we create, we used a cold presser task in order to trigger an escalation of pain um, in order to create a, a controllable uh, single stimuli that would be applicable across the different patient populations. So we sort of created uh, an in-laboratory task that would create a pain flare. Great, thank you. And then the other question we'll get to before moving on to the other panelists is from Ajay Wasan. Uh, Amy, how do you know that the patients on long-term abstinence from opioids had lower pain tolerance and more pain sensitivity even prior to being exposed to opioids as part of their essential phenotypic makeup? In other words, this phenomena may not be totally exposure to opioids. Uh, and doesn't the uh, health record data also suggest there may be underlying physiological differences that may have been there even prior to opioids? So I if, I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think um, you've got a great question. And I would love to, Dave, Will, a couple other you know, NIH people on there, I'd love to get funding to do a very long-term uh, longitudinal study of this because you're absolutely right. We're, that, that's a question that is still very much out there. Um, and it is something that we really need to understand the long-term physiology as far as how do we begin to predict or how do we further develop our understanding of risk factors for patients that may have these long-term um, long-term effects, uh, and I completely agree. I think uh, we we absolutely need to have a long, longitudinal study um, looking at patients preemptively, um, maybe before starting from before they get on any opioids at all. They've got chronic pain. They're starting an opioid regimen. They're on a, a steady state opioid regimen for a while. Now they're off an opioid regimen, um, and it, that would be you know a, a very long-term longitudinal study. Uh, but it absolutely needs to be done. Thank you, Amy. And, and I look forward to seeing that grant application when it comes in. <laughs> um, so uh, 
So let's now move to uh, comments from our other esteemed panelists and being a good researcher, I went ahead and randomized the order uh, and I'm gonna unblind myself. And um, Eric, if I could call on you first to, to provide your comments. Sure, and that was, that was a, a great nerdy researcher joke. I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> So great to speak with all of you. And I wanted to just provide some observations from my decade long clinical and mechanistic research program focused on the intersection of chronic pain and prescription opioid misuse. So I've been conducting clinical biobehavioral research on interventions designed to target the pathogenic mechanisms undergirding opioid misuse. And a lot of my work's been focused on mindfulness based interventions. There's another arm to my research, which is focused more on basic science, and that is to answer the question, why can some chronic pain patients take opioids as prescribed, whereas others go on to misuse them? And in my opinion, we need to be able to answer this question in order to understand which patients need to taper and how, also how to develop interventions to facilitate tapering for chronic pain patients who are at risk for opioid misuse and opioid use disorder. So let me start by telling you what does not predict opioid misuse in my data sets. And now this is going to actually be a nice contrast with what Amy just spoke about. So over the past 10 years, I've amassed clinical and psychophysiological data on more than 700 chronic pain patients receiving long-term opioid therapy. And about half of these folks endorse misusing opioids. In my data sets, pain severity does not discriminate patients who take opioids as prescribed from patients who misuse opioids. There's no significant difference in their pain severity levels. So if it's not physical pain severity that discriminates opioid misusers from chronic pain patients who are medication adherent with their opioids, what is it? I found consistently time and time again that it is emotional pain. And more importantly, the inability to self-regulate emotional pain that discriminates these two groups. Opioid misusers exhibit greater emotion dysregulation manifested by self-report autonomic and neurophysiological data in, that is indicative of a deficit, a specific kind of deficit that is in the capacity to use top-down cognitive control to regulate responses to emotional stimuli. And among misusers, we see a specific kind of deficit, and that is a deficit in their ability to shift their emotions in a positive direction. So it's not that opioid misusers merely have greater negative affect, but actually more importantly, they have a dearth of positive affect and an inability to upregulate positive emotions. That is to savor natural, healthy joy, pleasure, and meaning in life. And this finding flows from Kube's allostatic model of addiction that he put forth decades ago, stating that as the process of addiction develops, the person becomes increasingly sensitive to stress, pain, and drug-related cues, while becoming insensitive to the natural reward derived from healthy, positive events in the social environment, resulting in a downward spiral of dysphoria and craving that drives them to take higher and higher doses of the drug to maintain hedonic equilibrium. And that ultimately pushes people towards opioid use disorder. Therefore, interventions to facilitate opioid tapering and to treat opioid misuse among people with chronic pain should aim to enhance cognitive control to strengthen the self-regulation of emotions, reward, and craving. And to that end, I developed Mindfulness-Oriented Recovery Enhancement, or MORE, which is an integrative behavioral treatment rooted in affective neuroscience that unites complementary aspects of cognitive control training through mindfulness, negative emotion regulation through reappraisal, and positive emotion regulation through savoring into an intervention designed to simultaneously address addiction, stress, and chronic pain. In two stage two randomized controlled trials and in one stage one RCT involving a total of 240 patients, more was shown to significantly decrease opioid misuse, opioid use, craving, and chronic pain symptoms compared to an active supportive group psychotherapy control. And I conducted additional mechanistic studies along with these trials, including a study I recent, recently published in Science Advances, demonstrating that the effects of more 
on reducing opioid use, misuse, and craving among chronic pain patients was mediated by increases in the capacity to upregulate responses to natural reward cues and to downregulate responses to drug cues. And I showed this with an array of self-report, autonomic, and neurophysiological measures. So in other words, more appears to be reducing opioid misuse and craving by enhancing responsiveness to natural rewards relative to responsiveness to drug rewards. And this provides support for a hypothesis I came up with called the restructuring reward hypothesis, which states that shifting valuation from drug-related rewards back to valuing natural rewards will reverse the allostatic process and thereby decrease craving and addictive behavior. And so now I'm about to complete a NIDA R01 funded full scale RCT of more as a treatment for opioid misuse among chronic pain patients in primary care. And should more demonstrate efficacy again in this trial, more will have been shown to be efficacious in studies involving 500 opioid treated chronic pain patients. And if so, this intervention should be moved into later phase pragmatic real world clinical trials and towards widespread dissemination and implementation to reduce opioid misuse and facilitate opioid tapering. And that hopefully can help prevent this downward spiral leading to severe opioid use disorder. So thank you. Outstanding, thank you so much, Eric. Um, on blinding the second is Dan. Dan Claw, may I please call on you next? Sure. So I was gonna expand upon um, a few points that others have raised. The first one um, is that I really think we should talk more about this topic that Wilson Compton brought up in one of the first talks, which is um, that it's often difficult or impossible to differentiate a chronic pain patient with an OUD that has addiction as their primary problem with opioids versus those um, who are either tolerant or dependent on opioids. Um, and this wouldn't be such a big distinction. I mean, there's a lot of places in medicine where we have equipoise or we have a little bit of disagreement about how we should approach a given patient, but th that call of whether someone has an OUD um, or whether they're a chronic pain patient that is on an opioid that is not benefiting from an opioid leads to dramatically different treatments, actually the opposite treatment, i.e. keep the person on the opioid versus try to get them off of the opioid. Um, and although people who are primarily trained um, in addiction are well aware and continue to remind us um, about the potential problems um, that, that can occur when we take people off of opioids, like suicides and things like that, um, we know that all-cause mortality for a chronic pain patient on an opioid is 50 to 100 percent greater in any year than if that chronic pain patient wasn't taking an opioid. So there's a significant cost to that individual um, of, of continuing the, them on the opioid um, as well as a, a, a cost of the, in the addiction um, direction, i.e. So I, and we have virtually no data um, to really make that call and decide, you know, where in balance um, are we doing more um, help than harm for a person by having them taper versus um, the opposite. Um, and again, I think this is because those of us that were trained in the pain field and those that were trained in the addiction field are really coming at this from an entirely different standpoint. Second thing um, is that I think some of the studies that our group and others have done in the perioperative space made me question even more so than I did from taking care of chronic pain patients, why people um, like opioids and why they continue to take opioids. Virtually all of the studies that have been done in the last five years in the perioperative period that have looked at um, which individuals that are given opioids for uh, an acute surgical procedure continue to take those opioids at six months versus which um, individuals stop taking them. Again, I'll um, mirror what the last two speakers said. Pain intensity is never a predictor of whether someone is going to use more opioids or whether they're going to continue to be on opioids um, than uh, those that don't. But the, the, danger, the scary predictors are insomnia, depression, anxiety. Those are the biggest risk factors that we see over and over and over again 
um, in individuals that are given an opioid for acute pain, um, th those are the risk factors for individuals continuing to take those opioids. Now, we don't know that those people have an opioid use disorder. In fact, most of them probably don't. Um, but we have to really look closely at why is our patient wanting to continue to take the opioid? And if the reason is that they think it's a good hypnotic, that it helps them sleep better, that it reduces their stress, that it helps with their depression, I think we would all agree that um, opioids are not a class of drug that we should be using as a hypnotic, as an antidepressant, as an anti-anxiety drug. Um, and, I, and I think taking a more nuanced look at our patients with chronic pain on opioids um, may be very helpful in determining um, whether that person should stay on the um, opioid in the form of MAT, um, or whether that's a person that, like Gus says, I think we should be trying to convince our patients with chronic pain on an opioid that they, they want to taper and then voluntarily um, getting them to lower their dose of these drugs. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Dan. Um, uh, so I, some would say we're saving the best for last. Uh, Joanna, can I please call on you? <laughs> Um, yes, I like that introduction, although I respect my other speakers as well. Um, thanks for being here. It's really great um, to be part of this conversation. So the focus of my work has been really to determine and then disseminate best practices in opioid prescribing for chronic pain, focusing on the <clears throat> so-called risk mitigation strategies that clinicians use in their encounters with patients, like drug testing, use of treatment agreements, use of the prescription monitoring program, tapering, and more recently, um, use of medical cannabis as opioid substitution. So um, I kind of straddle, as a primary care provider, I straddle this fake divide between pain and addiction um, and really span the breath. And my research also includes outcomes in all of the above. So what I want to use my time for, which is not very much, is to really call attention to some of the big questions that I'm seeing in our field now from the perspective of a primary care provider treating pain and addiction and mental health. Um, so just to remember that primary care providers do treat most of the pain in this country, particularly the chronic pain. And our approach has been crude. Right. For many years, we were prescribing too many opioids, and then we realized that was not a good idea and really switched um, sometimes on a dime. And I think what we not need to do now is sort of step away from either indiscriminate use of opioids or indiscriminate non-use and avoidance of opioids to really coming up with a more nuanced approach. Um, so when we think about weighing the risks and benefits of opioids, we do need to think about that from an individual level. So some of the approaches like Dr. Darnell mentioned with a patient-centered approach um, and practical um, pragmatic trials are really critical. And where I'd also like to see us go is more towards a precision medicine approach so we can gather really translational data about which approaches are going to work for which patients. So on that note, some of my big questions are, when is it appropriate to continue even high dose opioids um, for patients with chronic pain? Um, who does not need a taper? What are the risks of tapering? We're still working on that. Um, and what are the benefits of tapering, including these patient-centered outcomes that have come up. What are the right kinds of tapers for whom? There is some mechanistic work that has to be done here, certainly understanding the role of psychological distress, as we've talked about, um, in thinking of what kind of interventions are going to work for people in the list of concepts that we've talked about related to psychological distress. I would add trauma. Um, which is really critical in our patients who have chronic pain and has um, challenging opioid courses. And um, I just lost my train of thought there, but um, so the psychological distress. Um, 
I would like to see us more examining novel treatments to support opioid tapering. So maybe more non-opioid medications, certainly more non-pharmacologic treatment. I love the mindfulness and self-regulation approaches we've heard about. We do need studies about transitioning to buprenorphine, as Dr. Merlin um, brought up. We also really need to study medical cannabis. Um, I understand that it's a Schedule I um, substance right now. So many people are using it and are using it for pain, and we really have such huge evidence gaps in terms of the benefits and the risks. So big um, call for further research there. Um, and then it, it, just a couple more things that are really important. Um, we need to address racism in pain and addiction treatment. We know it exists, right? We've done a lot of studies. I've done a couple of studies. Other people here have as well. We have found that there are differences by race in who's prescribed opioid medications, who gets urine drug testing, who is tapered from their opioids. So we need to now move on to interventions that we can use to address this. Um, interventions to reduce disparities, to address intersecting stigma. We heard about stigmas related to chronic pain and addiction, and we need to include racism in there as well. And then finally, in my final moment on the floor, for now, um, I also want to uh, sort of extend something that um, Dr. Clow was mentioning which is that we do need to move forward in our field more standardized definitions. So we, we all know what opioid use disorder is, um, and there have been increasing conversations about you know, whether you call it a gray zone or a complex persistent opioid dependence, um, whatever we want to whatever we want to call this thing is the problem, right? We need to standardize the definitions so that we can study them and we're talking about the same constructs in order to improve patient care and advance our research. So thank you. I hope that was under five minutes. No, that was great, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to try to start answering questions that have come in the chat box. If you, I, I'd like to echo the, if you did not see what Shelly Sue wrote earlier about the importance of please using the chat box, because to be honest, there's way, way more good questions than we're going to have time to be able to get to all of them. So if you could make sure to the, if you could enter your questions into the chat box, we'll be able to circle back. You. I know it's not as satisfying as having it read and answered live on the air, but we'll try to get to what we can and then definitely want to be able to have an opportunity later to, to answer your questions. So uh, if I could start with the question. So I saw there were a couple of questions from Christian Beasley to Beth about the Empower program, but I also saw, Beth, that you answered some of them via chat. Did you want to add anything or did you already, do you think you answered the questions from, from Christian? I, I I thought I answered them, but I, I would I would ask Chris whether I answered yes. them to her satisfaction. <laughs> That's probably a yeah. better question than asking Beth. Kristen, did you answer your questions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, really the idea is that, you know, we have a whole, as you mentioned, we have a whole population of people that are being forced tapered. And um, that population in terms of their outcomes, um, treatment preferences, loss of control, fear, and a whole lot of other you know, factors will likely influence outcomes. And so I'm just really interested and maybe other panelists have seen or done analysis between people who are you know, forcefully tapered versus those who um, volunteer to do so. You know, and, and what can we do to, to help those, those people? If yeah. I may, this is Bob. Could I jump in? I don't mean to defend you, Beth, but I do think that Chris, you're raising a hugely important issue. I'm. Um, I've talked about this exactly this issue, raised it right from the beginning with Beth's trial, and I I think that better understanding of actually situations in which providers. I really have learned this more from Will Becker in my orbit, a primary care provider. He's made it clear that there are certain situations where providers feel, believe 
that they, it's their obligation to taper. There's a safety risk, um, uh, you know, an acute safety issue, and um, it's their imperative to take, you know, more definitive action. Um, in in the context of Beth's trial, and I would say in clinical context, this issue about the communication with patients and knowing where you really, as a provider, um, don't really have a choice and making that clear to a patient and where there is an opportunity where it's more gray to try to help, maybe through motivational interviewing, to try to uh, help the patient come to the decision to taper um, or to do that in a shared way. I think this is really important and it's important in the context of these kinds of trials uh, that we work on the uh, measurement issues and um, how we can address them in the context of the trial as well as in the clinical setting. Thank you. And, and if I may, I would just like to um, add to what you said, Bob, which is whether, you know, there's going to be circumstances where a taper may be involuntary for clear safety issues. Um, what has been lacking is the very careful monitoring to ensure that our patients are safe through the taper and after the taper. So it's almost like there's two separate issues, you know, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, and everyone knows I'm more in favor of voluntary, but what is absolutely lacking is the multidimensional monitoring for safety every step of the way with flexibility in uh, addressing patient needs per their report of symptoms. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, this one was from uh, John Farrar. Uh, to Amy, does the risk of addiction continue beyond six to 12 months or is it only during the initial start on opioids? Um, that's a good question. I, that's not my particular area of, of study of, of the onset of that. Um, my work is more with patients once they've been diagnosed. Um, but, and patients often don't recognize when that hard stop is between opioid abuse and addiction. And oftentimes there's sort of a slide into addiction, particularly if they start with um, prescription medications, it may ramp up, it may ramp up, it may ramp up, they may change providers two or three times in order to continue to get that uh, increased medication. Um, dosage even after the original provider might be a little hesitant to do so, um, particularly in areas such as um, before I was at University of Colorado, I was out in Massachusetts and it was very easy to cross state lines. And so uh, state registries for opioids didn't really mean much because you go half an hour south and you're in Connecticut, you go half an hour north, you're in uh, New Hampshire, Vermont. Um, so you could, you had access to a lot of different states with opioid registries that didn't talk very well. Um, and so oftentimes there's a slide into that. So um, I would say it's actually fairly rare that patients would get diagnosed with an OUD in the first six to 12 months, um, simply because it takes time for the, the patient to develop an issue, to recognize that there's an issue for providers or family members to start to recognize an issue to get them to the place where they would get a formal diagnosis of, of OUD. But I think that process is still being researched. Thanks, Amy. I, I think we do have some uh, expertise on that topic in, in addition to you. Do any of the other addiction specialists on the call want to take a shot at this? I just wanted to add a, a point, which is that, of course, in the in prescription opioid use disorder, all this gets really muddy, because a lot of the a lot of the DSM five criteria for uh, opioid use disorder involve social so social dysfunction, maladaptive social behavior that may not show up in the case of an op of a, somebody with prescription opioids, as long as they don't run out of medication. Once they run out of medication, then you may see some of the aberrant medication-related behaviors that, that then are more, more of a signal of opioid use disorder. But it, as long as the person has, has, uh, has a prescription, it may be harder to detect uh, their, their behaviors that, that signal a more severe OUD.
Kathy, so, please. This is <clears throat> Kathy, and I'm afraid I don't know how to raise my hand electronically, but I, I wanted to add something to the conversation of papering that I feel like we haven't touched on it. The closest we got was shared decision-making in patient-centered care that Beth was talking about to my mind, but it is the absence of preparation of your average primary care clinician to have a discussion about addiction with the patient in a way that is non-stigmatized, helps them overcome and guilt, and um, talk about something that is condition that there's this act of silence because the provider doesn't know how to happen and they don't want to offend the patient. Um, and it relates to alcohol and can. And in my experience for 25 years as a primary care provider, you can have those conversations and help patients understand what is and, um, and that it's a biological thing. And I had patients come to me after two weeks of who, with an alcohol use disorder and say, oh, doctor, no, this is not good. Remember, we talked about thinking about the drug all the time and my brain is going there and I want to get off it. And, and I think there's this massive gap in workforce due to stigma that has to get bridged and honestly across institutes in NIH in order that all that that kind of addiction comes out of the closet, if you will, in a way to talk about it, patients can self because there's a problem of lack of self disclosure of symptoms that leads to under treatment. To kind of put that out there because as I see all the stuff that's been rolled out since I left practice actually in 11 around tapering, I was shocked how little preparation were primary caters around conversation on stigmatized stigmatizations around addiction, and that that somewhere has to be on agenda. I think that's great. Thank, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, Let's move on to the next question. Uh, it's another uh, excellent question from Jessica Merlin to Amy. Uh, are there any lessons from your psychophysiology or any other studies about optimal approaches to treat people on medication treatment, so like methadone or buprenorphine for OUD, and then develop a new painful condition such as cancer? Uh, and again, I think some, I think there's some researchers that are sort of starting to look at it. Um, the the challenge is it really does need to be a fairly large uh, patient population or a fairly large um, multi-site study since it's not I mean cancer rates and things along those lines uh, would be tough and then you have to recruit uh, those individuals so I think you're probably having to look at a fairly large multi-site study in order to get enough uh, to make an an emphasis for that uh, or to make a, a any kind of research-based conclusions from, from that kind of group where they start with OUD or they start with pain, then they move to OUD and then they have cancer or something on top of that. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, I don't think we have research on that. Now, if we just extrapolate based on the research that I've given, um, I think we do need to be very, very cautious because what we're saying is that patients have a history of OUD, then they are much more likely to show less tolerance and greater sensitivity to pain situations. And so if they're now in a situation like um, cancer or uh, other, other painful conditions, they're going to actually be, statistically, they're going to be in a position where they're going to be more sensitive and less tolerant of those of that pain. And so really making sure that we're doing a 360 uh, assessment and treatment proposal for patients so that they can have not just whatever pharmacological treatment might be out there, but that we're also looking at uh, psychological, physiological, uh, and physical components as well, that, that multimodal uh, that, that multimodal bubble that I gave uh, on one of my slides, um, I think that's going to become even more critically important. But at this point, we don't have any research that I know of to stand on to say, this is, this is what we do. Great. Um, so uh, next comment is from John Farrar. Uh, it's, it's, you addressed it to Amy, but I think it's a good question for, for the group as a whole, for, for all the panelists and participants. Um, for definition purposes, we need to keep clear the reasons for reducing opioid prescriptions. One, 
patient issues, potential long-term personal misuse, abuse, or other long-term effects, and two, societal reduction in availability of opioids. Uh, these two are very different and have different solutions. Um, is that resonate with people on, not just on the panel, but other people? And uh, which do you think is more important? I just want to. Um, Please. I think I think it's a really important question. I, I, um, I think one of the bigger issues is is defining craving, and and for a lot of patients, um, craving is an affective experience. And so, getting back to and what we're going to hear about more this afternoon is some of the um, negative affective aspects that are involved. And for some people, craving is a very uh, physical experience. And so it, I think craving in and of itself is um, a really important multidimensional construct that hasn't been thoroughly studied in the context of, of pain and OUD, um, particularly at that cross section. And so um, I think Eric has a comment that maybe he could expand more, but, but definitely um, just from an addiction perspective, craving is a very hard construct to, to pin down. Yeah, Katie, th I totally agree. And I just wanted to add a little bit of detail. So when, when you, in, in, a, in my data, we use a Q-reactivity paradigm that's taken right out of uh, addiction science. And so we show these long, uh, chronic pain patients who are treated with long-term opioids, uh, images of opioids and opioid pill bottles. And we ask them to rate their craving while we measure their physiological response. And in a simple multiple regression analysis, if you, if you punch in uh, chronic pain severity and you punch in uh, psychological pain, whether it's a measure of overall psychological distress or whether it's a measure of PTSD or depress, depression symptom severity, when you, when you put, them in, put these variables in simultaneously, uh, emotional pain more strongly predicts Q elicited opioid craving than physical pain. And this is in chronic pain patients who are prescribed long-term opioids. Great. A any other comments on this point? All right. Uh, I, I would just oh, comment go ahead. that I think the, the answer was actually to my next comment, which was about the development of craving, um, which is, I think, a, a very important issue, as was just discussed. But I think what you had asked is the need to differentiate between the need for tapering or the reduction in opioids uh, relative to individual patient needs um, and societal needs. And when, uh, when it's presented that 51 per 100, there are 51 prescriptions, opioid prescriptions per 100 people in the United States, that number suggests that the availability of opioids in general is way too high, and I would agree with that. But when I take care of an individual patient who needs opioid for their uh, chronic pain, uh, that's a different issue, and I'm not really considering the societal issues unless I think that they're diverting or something else is happening with them. And, and I think the solutions to treating the individual patient are clearly very different than the reduction in availability of opioids from a societal perspective which are complicated by a whole host of other uh, components. Um, and so I was wondering whether, actually I'd be very interested to hear whether people feel that today we're talking mostly about the patient or are we talking also about the epidemic of opioid use, which is, as somebody pointed out, not simply prescription drugs, but lots and lots of illicit drugs as well. Um, so I, I'd raise that question and ask if anybody has thoughts. Hi, this is Joanna. Um, I would hope that we're all talking about the individual patient um, and making decisions for that patient with society in mind, right? So that acknowledging that some patients are prescribed opioid more than they need or higher dose than they need or a dose that is toxic for them. Um, but I, I don't think that we're talking about reducing individual patients' doses based on a, a number out there in society. I'd just like to add to that if I could. Um, John, it was a really great point. And, and Joe, to your point too, I think 
we endeavor to focus on the individual patient, but often when we look at policies, organizational policies and imperatives that are focusing on doses, it really gets a little more at this, at this point about treating a population. Um, the overprescribing, I, I touched on that point at the beginning of my talk, which is to at least to help reduce the risks. We, we need better pain care nationally. And um, there, there just needs to be a better investment in that at, at every level. And um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Also, we need to, you know, we need to discriminate between patients who, who take opioids as prescribed and, and at least from their own per lived experience, they are, they're, they're achieving relief and they're functioning sat at a sat satisfactory level, discriminating those patients from patients who are misusing opioids and then moving on the path to OUD. And there's certain, obviously there, there are both types of patients out there um, in society. And, and actually the majority of patients, it seems, take opioids as prescribed. They don't misuse them and they do okay, with, they do okay on them. Now, whether or not the opioids are actually alleviating pain, that's a, that's a very big topic that, you know, there's some seminal studies out there that have been done uh, that we all know about that, that suggest that on the whole, maybe they don't. But that's a bit of a separate issue. Um, if, if it's not destabilizing the person's life, then maybe we shouldn't be mucking around with it. But we need, we need to pay attention to and offer care to people who are more at risk, who are not getting the help they need, or rather are experiencing iatrogenic harms as a result of the medication. That's where I, I think that there's a need for more training as well, because um, I need to dig into my files and find this again, but I think it was the American Academy of primary care physicians, uh, I'm, I'm mucking up that reference, but um, they, they actually did a, an assessment of their, their providers and said, okay, how many of you think that one or more of your patients is diverting? And 0% said that their patients were diverting. And yet we know that there is some diversion happening. It is a, likely a very small percent of patients that, that are taking this out on the street. But when we think about individual care, we also do need to think about societal care as well. I don't, I think these two issues do dovetail together um, and that we can't say, oh, well, this is over here and this is over here because that siloing is what got us into some of this trouble in the first place, that pain is over here and addiction is over here. So I think we want to make sure that we're seeing for each in each patient, we want to do what's best for that patient and we want to make sure that not only are we doing what's best for that patient, but we also want to consider that patient within the bigger societal context as well, because of that, those key pieces that we don't want to say yes or no, because we might not be that great at understanding or knowing when our patients might be diverting or selling a pill here or there or have a um, junior high or high school kid that's going into the medicine cabinet and stealing some meds for a party. Um, you know, we're, we're just, we're not good at that. Uh, and so maybe increasing training on how might you begin to assess that? How might you begin to um, look at that in a, in a different way so that we can both treat the patient individually at the best level we can while also keeping in mind some of these societal pieces as well. Um, if I can Let comment. me jump in. Let me jump in here. And um, so uh, in a previous life, I used to provide direct patient care for substance abuse treatment programs. And one of my group roles was we start on time and we end on time. So in sticking with that theme, we are going to wrap this up. And I want to say thank you so much to my outstanding, outstanding panel, Beth, Amy, Joanna, Eric, and Dan. That was fantastic. Um, and thank you to the audience, to the audience, to the other pan uh, people on the, on the call for some truly outstanding questions. Uh, and so at the time, we, I'm now going to turn it back over to, I believe, Leslie, or do we go directly to, um, to, I don't know who gets it, who has the ball now? 